everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is a uh, part three on the character study of Abraham. If, if you did not see the first two episodes, they're uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So uh, you're welcome to go back and watch watch them. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm just um, did a search for the name Abraham. Of course, before Abraham, he was called Abram. And every time his name is listed in the scripture, uh, look at it and see what we can learn about the life and the man named Abraham. Um, so right now, I'm going to begin with uh, chapter 19 in Genesis. Let me find the uh, place where I left off last time. Um, we'll read in King James first. Uh, it'll be verse uh, Genesis nineteen twenty seven. Uh, uh, and Abraham get up early in the morning to the place that uh, you see. Abram got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. Well, that doesn't tell me a whole lot, so let's click on in context and see what this is, uh, where this is taking place. Uh, it says, but his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Aha. Okay. Now I have the reference point we need. Uh, verse 27 says, And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord, and he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and toward all the land of the plain, and beheld, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. So, obviously this is talking about the, the fact that uh, Lot was warned. Uh, he, he was warned by the, the angels that told him to get his family out of Sodom. And uh, they did get out before Sodom was destroyed. But his wife did look backwards. She was told to not look back, to look at the future. Don't, I guess it's symbolic of look forward to your, the future. Don't think about the past. But to she look back disobeyed the instructions and was turned into a pillar of salt. And then uh, we know that uh, Abram, Abraham was not there, but he can see the results of what happened. And I guess the his bargain with the Lord, <laughs> uh, the, the Lord, let me see, somebody's whistling, so somebody must be with me. Uh, I'm sorry, excuse me for interrupting, excuse me. Okay, who is that? Uh, Lord Tommy, a.k.a. St. Tommy. Hey, St. Tommy, how are you? I'm feeling pretty good. Excuse me for interrupting. I didn't realize you were in the middle of uh, of uh, edifying somebody out there. Excuse well, me. I'm glad you said something. I could have gone on and on and never known you are with me, so I'm glad you can join me. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with what I'm doing today, but I'm continuing a character study on the person known as Abraham. And I'm right now at the point in Genesis uh, chapter 19 where Abraham is looking back at uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, not looking back. Uh, is Lot's wife is the one that looked back and got turned into a pillar, a pillar of salt. But Abraham is from the distance observing that uh, Sodom and Gomorrah had gone up in smoke. Uh, so uh, I'm glad you could, could join me. How are you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm uh, feeling a little bit... Um uh, in new territory a little bit, but all in all good. It's a good day. Yeah, it is. And it's, uh, you know that, have you ever heard people say, uh, you ask them how they're doing, they say, well, I'm above ground and that's good. <laughs> I, don't, yeah, but I, I don't like that saying because, you know, uh, as a saint, you know, I, I do believe that absent 
from the body is present with the Lord and uh, to live as Christ, but to die as gain. So uh, another day waking up, I mean, I'm happy to spend time with you and with my family and my friends and carry on in my ministry. But the idea of that, uh, uh, oh yeah, I, I'm, how am I doing? Well, I'm not dead at least, I'm happy about that. But don't we have wonderful things to look forward to? So I don't see why a saint should have that kind of attitude. Well, I heard that if it's, I heard that if I look for good things, even as you know, as strained as my personal reality is, which it is strained, but if I look for good things, that I'll see them, and and that helps with with uh, with feeling good, you know, with feeling upbeat about opportunity that's before us, you know, opportunity to spend time edifying each other, talking about. Uh, meaningful things, uh, just good things to do. Yeah. Uh, if I look for good things. Mm -hmm. uh, so I hear you on that, that if, uh, I guess that's starting at the bottom to say, well, at least I'm breathing. You know, that's that's a, that's a positive vision, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah. may we be a little more ambitious and look for grand good things. You know, as long as we're here pulling time, may we the time as long as we're pulling it I, I i tell myself you know or i try and preach to myself like that to, to keep a good faithful focus positive focus yeah well you're a you're definitely a positive stinker i mean positive thing thank you thank you you smell great too my brother you do <laughs> and, uh, uh, yes. well let me kind of put this in, in perspective of where I, I don't know if you watched the first two episodes on, on Abraham, but the last thing that I'd been discussing was the fact that uh, um, Abraham and his wife had these three people come and visit him. And most people believe that two of them were angels and one of them was the Lord. Uh, and, and then uh, Abraham was bargaining with the Lord about uh, destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. And he, he uh, bargained it all the way down to 10 good people. If God could find just 10 good people, he wouldn't destroy the city. Uh, Brother Bill, at that point, he, he, he said that he thought that the, uh, they weren't two angels in the Lord. He thought that it was the, uh, the Godhead, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, all as he, you're familiar with the idea of a theophany or Christophany, where you have incarnate, pre incarnate appearances of Jesus and, and God. Oh, yes. yes, I've, I've um, uh, uh, heard, heard, you know, different, different uh, perceptions about, about the aforementioned. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. yummy, well, yummy contemplations about them. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And I actually, uh, it stimulated my, uh, uh, my mind so I thought well at some point after maybe the character study of Abraham is finished I might take on it take it on as a new subject uh, and let me see okay oh, yeah, Google effects um, and, and do the do actual study of uh, theophanies Christophanies and then an idea that Bill introduced he called it a triophany and I uh, I've never heard anybody say it before, but it's the first time anybody's introduced the idea that uh, I, that I know of that that this was the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all appearing at one time if, uh, to Abraham and Sarah. Um, so at some point, uh, I think it would be very interesting to do a, a, a study on Theophanies, Christophanies, and also this term "angel of the Lord." Ooh. That the angel, angel of the Lord, whenever we see the term angel of the Lord, uh, some people think it's uh, an angel uh, that's a messenger of God. Sometimes people think it's a actual, just another way of saying God, an, 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 the, the angel of the Lord, you know. But uh, uh, that's for another day. Uh, well, that sounds like a noble contemplation, you know, not a little bit specialized. And, you know, that's not something one might hear from the pulpit every day, every Sunday, you know, such such uh, discourse or open contemplation. That does sound good. Mm -hmm. That does sound good to me. Yeah. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the angel of the Lord, but um, I'll, I, I'm also moved by 
by Bill's conceptualization that he shared. His, his, uh, yes, that sounds good. Yeah, that is, uh, I think it's unique and original. I, I've never heard of any theologian ever present that as an idea. Bill was concerned that he's going to be deemed as a heretic now to even say such a thing. But you know how so many people are quick to to uh, well, use that, that H word, you know. I'm sure Bill doesn't want to drift into heresy. Of course not. But, um, uh, you know, the scripture says, take no judgment unto yourself. And, and with, with good will by faith, let us contemplate good things if we want to that others might be afraid to contemplate you know and and might they might point fingers out of fear but that's all right i salute bill for ignoring any judgment that may come from from uh you know fearful minded it's understandable you know folks want to encourage hyper orthodoxy of course we all want to be hyper orthodox but good for bill good for yeah uh, now, I, I've tried to increase your volume through the control uh, switch here, but uh, I wasn't able to raise it up. Uh, is there any way that you can increase your volume a little bit? Because I can hear you, but it's, it would be nice if it was a little louder. Oh, thank you. Thank you for, for saying that. I do love to be heard. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure how to do it. Uh, I, I went to the volume section. I can maybe just speak a little louder towards the microphone. Is that a sufficient volume? Not too yeah, that's, that's a little bit better. Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, let's carry on to the next verse. Uh, and now we've got, let me see. Um, it was Genesis 1927 that I looked at. Now let's look at Genesis 1929. Uh, uh, and it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. Uh, when he overthrew the cities of which Lot dwelt. Um, let me get a little more context there. 29. Uh, and Lot went up out of Zor and dwelt in the mountain and his two daughters with him, for he feared to dwell in Zor, and he dwelt in the cave, he and his two daughters. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, that's going to go off on a, uh, more of a talking about what happened with Lot and his daughters, I think. But uh, to try to stay focused here on uh, Abraham, there's not a whole lot to be said. It's just that Lot and he uh, separated. So let me go on to the next verse, Genesis 20, verse 1. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar, um, and Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. Yeah, this is, uh, this is the second time, you know, this is the second time that uh, um, I, I recall that Abraham is lying about the relationship between him and uh, Sarah. Yeah, he wasn't perfectly mature in speech. At that time, it seems like he, uh, yeah, interesting point. Yeah. Well, he's, uh, it looks like, uh, well, if he's in fear for his life, um, I saw a video by a, uh, one of the YouTubers I like. His video is, his uh, channel is called Ads for Christ. And he does really high quality videos, short ones, and, and he wants, Asked the question, is it ever okay for a Christian to lie? And uh, his, his conclusion was, yeah, if it's to, if it's to pre protect life. And uh, so maybe in this case, uh, uh, Abraham lying, um, because the reason that he lied about Sarah being his, his wife, and being a, said he was she was his sister rather than his wife. And in fact, she was his sister in a certain respect because the relationship was so close. Um, but... Uh, to deny that she was his wife was the purpose was because he was in fear for his life that they would want to kill him so they could take his wife from him. But instead, he he lets them take his wife anyway. That's what happened with the last king. That he took his wife and then God uh, put some kind of plague on the king's uh, house and, and uh, the king's 
King Center way and said, why didn't you tell me she was your wife? <laughs> it was a big, yes. a big mess. Yes. Um, I, I find that lately here on G+, I've been on for six months, I've heard that question and I've become uh, aware of the question of how it was posed. Is it okay for a believer in Christ Jesus to do whatever? Is it, is it okay? And, and what I want to mention is, is the word okay. Is it acceptable? Is it condemnable? Is it endorsable? I've, I've thought about what that means. What does it mean? Is it okay? Um, that's a tough concept to consider. Is it okay with our Father if we obfuscate the truth or don't speak the truth or, or lie? Uh, is it acceptable? Is it condemnable? Is it endorsable? Does he like it? When would he understand it? Or when is it more understandable? Anyway, I find that that concept of okay to be one that's commonly understood, but also has some deep implications that, that cause me to contemplate what it precisely means in context. In any case, um, I find, I find that, that, that word or, or phrase, okay, to be, it's hard for me to deal with that or to know what to do with that. Um, and I don't want to get off topic about, about, uh, Abraham, excuse me. But, uh, in any case, I appreciate you letting me mention that, um, because it is, it is, it did come up in my mind that, that the term, okay could mean a lot of things. It's not most desirable to lie by, by no means, but at times it may be, of course, more understandable than others. Um, now, I, I've felt like it's not good to lie for many years, and I've learned how not to, to how to avoid it uh, uh, in some ways, how to tell half truths or not to tell the truth, not to answer better not to answer than to lie uh how to tell a different truth rather than the truth that i'm like cornered into answering you know uh but anyway i i don't want to ramble too much other than to say that's an interesting contemplation about what a abraham did very full could spend a whole a whole you know 45 hour thinking about just yeah. that one incident very rich very rich. yeah yeah the the there's a one potential situation we can get ourselves into is when let's say my wife says how do i look in this dress and um i love that one abraham lincoln yes abraham lincoln's wife asks how do i look in this dress does it make me look fat <laughs> you know and he has a reputation of never lying you know honest yeah. day Yes, that's a great, great contemplation. Yeah. Yeah. So somehow you you might just be able to just change the subject and say, say, uh, uh, we we gotta go. We're gonna be late for the party. Let's hurry up <laughs> and not answer the question. Uh, or you might say, oh yes, you look great because, uh, you know, if you if you say that, wait, it, it's not flattering on you. It's not the right color or the right style or whatever. Then. You run the risk of not only hurting your feelings, but then dealing with an angry wife. <laughs> yes, honey, it's impossible for you to be fat. Uh, you know, uh, and then nothing uh, make you look fat, honey. You know that beautiful dress. Yes, that's a tough one. There, you have to do some world, some really, uh, really fast thinking on that one. You know, Four and then, misses, uh, misses. on a more serious note. Uh, another question is, uh, uh, where are the Jews? And you say, you could say, they're hiding in my cellar. Or you could say, uh, uh, we saw them run around the corner and go in that direction, you know, and to lie in order to save their life. And I, I think most people could rationalize and say, the end justifies the mean in that case, and, and it's better to lie than to tell the truth. The Jews you're looking, these aren't the Jews you're looking for. 
you know, kind of like Obi Wan Kenobi, or or there are no Jews here that you would want. Uh, that's a tough one, you know. Look a man in the eye who's got a pistol, who's got an evil intent, and he thinks he's a do-gooder. And there are little children in the basement who call themselves Jews. You know, what do you do? I'd uh, quickly lie my butt off with a world-class performance. Uh, of course I would, but is that best? Is it best to somehow say something else that would be more truthful and more effective at protecting those, those children, you know, whoever they are? Uh, yeah. Deep contemplation, you know, I would, of course, compromise my personal ethics or, or my, uh, you know, who wants to make our father mad, not me, you know, um, uh, lying lips and abomination, you know, I would, I, I would hesitate to guess that some lying lies, maybe it's the lying lips that, the, that are the abomination, not the lies. A good lie, a white lie. Maybe that's understandable to our father, but one who has habitually, cunningly deceptive lips, lying lips. Maybe that's the abominable thing that uh, that is perhaps highlighted in Scripture, and and maybe it's it's good to tell the truth. Maybe yes, be yes, and no, be no. But uh, yeah, maybe maybe some half truths or redirect redirections are more understandable in a reasonable kind of way to our father but, uh, just thinking out loud about the nature of deception yeah about yeah just thinking about it well no one knows what would have happened if abraham had told from the beginning that uh sarah was his wife uh if if he they would have killed him or not but it, in this case this lie he kind of ended up creating a big problem but ended up prospering from it it looks like uh it says and it came to pass when god caused me to wander from my father's house uh oh i'm thinking i'm on the wrong point here let me see uh he says and and bimelech said unto abraham what sauce sauce thou that thou hast done this thing he, he lied to him and, and caused uh him to apparently he took Sarah as his wife and you know it's not it's not just he lied and said she's my sister and then she went to, into this king and became his wife I mean that's that's pretty extreme that you let a man take your wife in fear for your life uh, so in that way it was really quite uh, cowardly and, and uh, horrible I mean I can't imagine doing that myself and Abraham said, because I thought, surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. Um, but it turned out, though, that uh, uh, it sounds like he might have been in the grips of fear, you know, that he would get his throat cut if he said one word. So he, to save his own life, maybe, in fear of his own life and that of his wife, he didn't say anything he kept his mouth yeah. shut maybe yeah. that was that and then and then he ex further explains to abimelech he's, he says and yet indeed she is my sister she is the daughter of my father but not the daughter of my mother and she became my wife so there it is they were a close relationship and sister in a certain sense and uh but at that time a uh, close relations uh, were still marrying i guess Hmm. Well, yeah, that does seem a little racy by uh, our cultural mores, but uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 I ain't saying nothing. I mean, there's a lot going on in this culture, and uh, you know, I ain't saying nothing about that one. But look how it turned out for Abraham. It says, and Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him Sarah, his wife. <sighs> So he ended up coming out of it smelling like a rose, except that his wife was, uh, you know, uh, taken by the king. I, I can only imagine that uh, the, that relationship was, you know, consummated. And uh, I, well, that's the, that's the kind of thing that's hard for me to, to uh, understand how Abraham could allow that. 
Well, the uh, it just sounds like the mercy and grace of uh, of God that God uh, bestowed bestowed upon Abraham. You know, regardless of his uh, less than stellar uh, speech, you know, less than than honest or less than truthful, uh, less than faithful, less than uh, uh, yeah, truthful speech. He got grace and favor anyway, regardless of his performance. You know, yeah, uh, yeah uh, he must, uh, our father must have loved him, loved him in spite of his wicked little ways. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, we know that he had made big promises and had big plans for Abraham. And, uh, but he ends up coming out of this smell like a rose. It says, um, uh, and unto Sarah, he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee and with all other. Thus she was reproved. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bare children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Well, that's interesting. You know what that makes me think is that this transpired over a long period of time rather than like a matter of a day or two. I, I had always thought that it was a, a very quick event that happened. Yeah, a couple of weeks or something, but that indicates like a few months, if not yeah. a year. Yeah. You know, a long time to notice that things had been closed up. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Uh, so, um, okay, uh, uh, but he ends up getting land. He, he says, "Go, you can live anywhere on my land." And he gave him all this, the the uh, animals and the, all the uh, silver, and he ends up um, doing quite well. Uh, in, and it all started with this lie. But I wonder how it would have gone if he hadn't lied. Or maybe, maybe Abimelech would have liked him anyway, just as much. But uh, I don't know. That's, uh, that's a, a reasonable contemplation, you know. Um, but you know, it's uh, in some ways I agree with you that it, uh, that I always end up with about the same place with that contemplation. I just don't know. I just don't know what what would have happened if I had played it a different way or acted more faithfully, or what if Abraham had had played things more faithfully i just don't know i end up at the same place yeah that that what if is a really uh interesting question i i was pondering that in my life just recently and thinking back you know would i have changed things if i could go back and change things and uh um uh, i my conclusion was i i wouldn't want to change anything even the things that were turned out that uh, I, at the, it seemed like it was a mistake, but if you were in, and the fact is, everything played its part in getting to me where I am now. And where I am now, uh, I, I'm just completely thrilled with, with uh, where God has, has brought me, with my wife, my son, my situation in life, uh, my ministry, everything. And if I had gone and thought back, uh, well, if I hadn't done gone that route if i if i had let's say had gone into a different profession or uh, stayed with my first wife you know you know look how things dramatically would have been different you know and so that's I, cool I, I, see that. isn't, it, isn't it cool to see how all those painful things that earlier i wouldn't have experienced you know for all the money in the world i, I would have changed it but now I, I see that it's okay and it worked out great and and no I wouldn't have any any other way either I've got three young ones you know uh, uh, here here at the mission house and uh, if my first girl had had stuck with me you know it's just I'm just glad I see order in it I see goodness in it and that's very relieving to say you know maybe that wasn't such a 
Uh, I mean, it was hell to live through in one hand or, or distasteful, but it's all been ordered. It's very comforting to see that. It gives me great hope for today, that today is right on time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, whew, that's brave. That's a brave thought for me personally. Yes, that God is in control and that uh, uh, he's working with me, you know, working with me or, or patient with me. Uh, that's very very comforting and I, I I could even take it a, another step further and say thank, thank God he did not answer some of my prayers or I shouldn't say he didn't answer but his answer was no I'm praying for something and he, he ended up saying no I didn't get it but in hindsight if I had gotten it my life would have gone a completely different direction and I wouldn't be where I am now and I'm just I'm so happy that I'm here right now with with everything the way it is. And I, I, I mean, that the thought of me not having my wife because I had gone a different direction and therefore not having my son, I mean, that to me is just beyond. Um, yeah, beyond uh, desirability. You know, yeah. it's it's like the, any other scenario. Uh uh. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm definitely glad you're here right now. <laughs> And I mean, I know that's petty of me, but I am the center of my universe and you rock. Uh, now, as far as you being a minister, uh, uh, it's my good pleasure to share with you that how I may truthfully see you is as an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ by default. You know, whether you get up in the morning and, and uh, uh, preach or whether you go and play golf or whatever you do everywhere you do it you are an ambassador of christ jesus and i am pleased with his ambassador yes uh edifying to me personally again being a little egocentric but uh i am excited for us both sir excited for us both when i behold what he has done in my life and yours and the opportunities of this day the fear peels away and uh May we, may we envision well, oh, about desires. You know, what I desired back in the day when I was about 23, I prayed so hard, Bill, so hard for what was desirable in my sight and for, for you know, and there's a scripture that says the Lord gives us the desires of our heart. Um, as children, as children of him, some of the desires of our heart may be half-baked very holy and from him the desire for for uh, uh a desire can be a desire that's not maturely conceived and uh but anyway all the good desires of our heart i heard the lord gives us he he, he has given us those good appetites and he will uh fulfill them all all the the deepest most holy part of our desires you know even if we misconceive of them uh even if we envision them uh in a juvenile manner he is faithful and uh yeah i'm right there with you i am very pleased that he did not give me the the way that i wanted it what i desired so strongly he had a better way and uh of course i would have chosen it different but there's a scripture that says the plans of man are many but the lord's will prevails <laughs> and uh yes so some of uh, some of our plans you know may we plan by faith may we step up to the plate and make a schedule you know and uh by faith may we give it a shot go through it and uh, uh with faith that the lord has good up his sleeve excuse me in his mind for us and uh by faith may we go for it this day with forward focus uh yes yeah it's wonderful that he um, he doesn't always say yes to us and sometimes his answer is no and sometimes his answer is wait not now but um as far as getting the desires of my heart, what I found is that the desires have changed so much. Like 
this is one of my great desires right now talking to you hopefully having people watching us and enjoy, enjoying this uh, conversation and this study and maybe for years to come people clicking on this video and, and benefiting from it this is the desire that I have now to, to find someone who loves Jesus who wants to talk about the Bible but if, if we went back 40 years ago uh, for me to ever predict or my friends or family to ever predict that that would be the desire of my heart that <laughs> it was that would be some far-fetched almost impossible thing you know because it was it was not even in in my uh, consideration that, that that's where my desires would go well he's quite an artist he's quite an artist you know to bring us through our youth uh, you know to uh, me in my case you know, uh, I would I would cringe to tell you how he has brought me through and from and the mindsets that I have sported in my youth, you know. Uh, uh, but he he uh, I, I I presume he has a vision of who we are, the little children we are, even in our sophisticated uh half-baked mind you know we act out we conceive of ourselves in a worldly way in our youth and we think worldly and we act worldly but he sees past all of that he sees the end game he is making us uh uh he started us and he he you know brought us through our youth and he's gonna bring us right on in to home <laughs> Yes, yes, that's exciting to think that uh, I'm not my own piece of art, you know, uh, that I am his and and that in some ways I'm not responsible for uh, for trying to fabricate myself to be a super saint, you know, uh, yeah, I want to, I want to, I love good, I love edifying people, preaching, talking about uh, truthful things. Uh, and and I, I would like to do it more better in some way or fashion or more often better or maybe less often uh, but better anyway uh um yes may I trust him trust him even in my half baked or three quarter baked or almost enlightened state I, I I feel very enlightened sometimes but may I trust him that uh that he is on time that he has a plan and 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 as I as I make a schedule, I uh, trust him. Yes. Well, you know, on Wednesday I'm doing this series called Wisdom Wednesdays. I'm going through the Book of Proverbs, and you made a proverb come to mind uh, about trust. It. And it, it's just, uh, I don't remember the address, but the, the scripture goes: Trust the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on thine own understanding. And uh, that's a tough one there. I, mean, I don't know if you if if you're like me, but if you have a lot of yummy, uh, advanced understanding go through your mind, it it's real easy to feel a little bit wise. Don't tell nobody, but it's easy to feel that way. To feel so knowledgeable about such good things, and uh, but I, but it also reminds me that it, all my understanding of the truth of Christ Jesus of the atonement of everything. All my understanding is uh, it's very fluid and it and and it's what's good for me when I am broken at the end of a marathon of some sort or at the end of a day what's good for me is to not to realize it's okay to park that understanding that that's not that's not me that's not what's he he is 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 understanding ain't good for relying on that only he can can keep me heal me only he can re, re reinvigorate me can 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 have me get some rest and yeah that's a great one there rely on him rather than understanding even if you've got a whole library of it it's still unreliable and and a poor replacement for casting oneself on him or presenting oneself to him and saying look here uh no promises but take me take me as a living sacrifice 
I think there's a scripture like that that says, present yourself as a living sacrifice. You know, just say here. But yeah, understanding, especially when, when one is a know-it-all or a know-it-almost-all, like I feel like so often, it can be hard to let go and just, okay, I don't, you know, just rely on him is so good. Yeah. Well, one of the things that about uh, discussing the parables is that uh, the parables were not written as as what like we're reading about Abraham now. This is a this is a uh, story that has a timeline of certain events and people, and that's much of scriptures is a like a story, a historical record. But Proverbs is not that at all. It's it's a collection of sayings, and and, and sometimes one verse alone. It stands alone, and it just that's all it's referencing. It's not referencing five verses ahead or five verses of, of behind. It's just this one verse and the truth in it. And in this verse, uh, it could be me talking about the uh, uh, your own understanding in terms of your, your understanding of theology, your understanding of of, of truths. Uh, oh, but I think it uh, it could also mean. Uh, your, the present circumstances you're in. Uh, trust the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on your own understanding about the situation you're in right now. And uh, you, you, you might be trying to figure out a solution. Like, look, Abraham, uh, he tried to figure out a solution to um, uh, first with Abimelech. He's trying to figure out a solution so that he doesn't get killed. And, and uh, you know, and, and so he told him, he made up this, he didn't he left out the fact that sarah was his wife so he he's taking it as the initiative to try to solve this problem instead of just trusting that the lord will, will handle the situation maybe if he had said this is my wife the lord you know the lord had plans for abraham i mean didn't he have enough faith here he is <laughs> this great saint of faith more than probably anybody else in the bible he's referred to this man of faith the father of faith and, and yet he didn't have enough faith to tell Abimelech, that Sarah was his wife. Uh, and so if he trusted the Lord, did not lean on his own understanding, and did not try to analyze the circumstances and try to figure out a solution on his own, maybe it would have gone even better for him. Uh, and that leads us to the next point uh, that I'm going to get to. Well, I'll let, you, I'll let you answer, respond to that, and then we'll go on to this next verse I want to talk about. Well, thank you for sharing that. That speaks to me. I'm uh, personally at, at a, at a, a particular, a particular point where I'm not sure clarity is not, uh, you know, not sometimes. Yeah, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm unsure in what to do, where to act, how to go, etc. So that speaks to me. Thank you, Bill. And uh, yes, very much so. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so now we got uh, the next verse is. Uh, uh, this get this is makes the same point that I just made here. Uh, uh, Genesis twenty one two. Now we're at the point where okay, they left Abimelech, they go to get established, and then what happens? Uh, for Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. <laughs> You see, uh, another example of the fact that Abraham, known as this great man of faith, and yet he and Sarah both demonstrated on several occasions lack of faith in the Lord's promise of them having a son through Sarah. They, they, they doubted, and, and, and uh, Sarah said, go take my handmaiden Hagar, and have a child with with her. She didn't have confidence that as she was getting older, I guess she was 80 at that point. Uh, uh, she's, I think she was 83 at that point. Of course, barren, because uh, after a certain age, a woman no longer is able to bear children. They're no longer menstruating. and So uh, she had given up, and she convinced Abraham, and he apparently he lost faith too because he agreed to it. And so they took the initiative, and they go, he goes with Hagar, and then they end up getting, uh, you know, um, uh, 
<laughs> All right, honey, if you say so. Yeah. Uh, Ishmael. So they get Ishmael out of the deal. And we know what happened with Ishmael. Uh, he was the product of Abraham and, and the Egyptian woman, H Hagar, and the descendants of Ishmael. God, to make up for this problem, that it was not part of his plan, but the, the initiative of Sarah and, and Abraham not trusting God to keep his promise. So God blesses Ishmael and says he'll become a great nation. And, 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 uh, and through all of his descendants, what, who do we have? We have the Middle Eastern countries uh, known as, you know, the uh, Arabias. And, and uh, uh, we have much of the Muslim world came out of that. So you have a half brothers, uh, um, Ishmael and Isaac, half brothers. And from the descendants of each of them, you have these different world religions we have uh, and, and different groups of people that are still in conflict to this very day and all because sarah didn't have the faith then she convinced abraham and they both ended up laughing at god on numerous occasions every time he re-promised he promised like three different times he said i'm I'm going to, Sarah's going to conceive. Sarah's going to conceive. And, and as she's getting older and older, they both ended up losing their faith and both of them laughing. That's what the last time was at the. Uh, it's so cool. He's faithful. You know, he makes something good out of um, unfaithfulness or out of a lack of, of believing him. He makes promises. I laugh. He's not offended. He does good things anyway, not based on on my uh, uh, fears. If I succumb to fears and, and, and speak unfaithfully, it doesn't annul his promise. It's based on his faithfulness. And that gives me heart there, you know, that even if I uh, act unfaithfully or think and speak unfaithfully, that he is faithful. He, he, he. <sighs> knows what he's doing and he has said it and that good things all things work to the good you know not that they are good in and of themselves but he takes things and makes it good mm -hmm. and, and it's it also reminds me that that our father perhaps can can right here with me and right there with you he can view reality perhaps in a certain way you know, he can perhaps not see what's coming down the pipe so that he can, uh, maybe he can experience with us our, our life as if he does not know what, what the end game is in some ways. Uh, I don't want to babble on about this, but in some ways I am excited about, about my father being excited about the decisions of this day that moves me to think that uh that he could be excited for me you know that in some ways he could experience my day with me as if he does not know what i'm gonna do precisely maybe and that that he's excited for me and excited for you, me and you but anyway i don't want to babble on about this but ooh, good. Yeah. Keep going, Bill. yes well well there's there's one of my favorite verses uh, I don't, again, I can't name the address, but the, the, it goes like this. When we have no faith, he remains faithful. Yes, that and, is a beautiful one. It, it, I think it goes like this. Even though you are faithless, I am faithful, for I cannot forsake myself. Yes, exactly. We're in Christ Jesus somehow, whatever mm -hmm. that means, and, and he is faithful. Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> uh so even uh, that should comfort all of us that, uh, you know, not only for eternal security, knowing that, uh, well, okay, if, if we get our life gets off track, he remains faithful. If Even if we have no faith because, uh, let's say that something really tragic happens. Like today, I saw in the news that um, our vice president, Joe Biden, he has a son that's 46 years old, and he just died of brain cancer today. And it's, it's been really, uh, been a tragic life because when his, uh, Biden's two sons were like little tiny children, like, like probably two or three years old, I guess. 
Um, his wife got in a car accident. She was killed, and the boys were very seriously injured. And he ended up raising his sons, uh, and, uh, and and they had a very close relationship. And now he has a, this son that he loves so much, just dies from brain cancer. And it's something like that, and these series of these horrible losses in life that ca could cause a person to curse God uh, and, and, or reject God and no longer believe. And, and so, you know, some people will say, well, oh, or if you're really a believer, you'll never lose your faith. But when a person is uh, suffering greatly like that, they lose their family or they, they have such great losses, they, it, I think it's only natural for them to question God, why God, or even say, why I don't even believe you're there anymore. You would allow this to happen to me. They lose their faith. But I know that even if we have no faith, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself, as you said. So that's comforting. And uh, it's, it's tragic when these things happen to people and it could very easily cause them to say, uh, either uh, curse God or not believe in God. It is understandable. And it's, it seems good that we reflect on that, that, that uh, things happen that we do not understand and horrible things even and it's all allowed to happen as a part of a very good plan as vexing as it is to behold uh at this point and from this point but god bless joe biden and yeah. and, and all he loves and and it's you know i'm i have political opinion and it might not i might not hold the same ideals as as biden but I love it when that fades into unimportance that, that, you know, and that everyone, everybody who walks the earth, whether, whether their heart is pure or whether it is on the way to being pure or whatever state they're in, uh, very few people have, uh, it's amazing how similar life is to a lot of people, whether you're loaded with duckies or whether you're, hitting the penny jar everybody cries and everybody is fighting fear and and uh yes that's that's good good uh god bless biden god bless him yeah yeah i i want to ask everybody to pray for joe biden and his family uh, and let's set aside any as you said these political differences time like this uh, you know he he needs our prayers all right, uh, I'm going to go to Genesis 21, uh, 3. And, and, and Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. Um, and uh, I don't know what the word name Isaac means. Almost every name uh, has some real interesting meaning behind it. If, you're, if you know laughter, it. I think laughter, um, uh, if my memory serves. My firstborn is named Isaac. And, uh, but I think I think if I recall, I know my missus knows. She'd probably hit me in the head for saying I don't know. But uh, I think it's laughter, sound of laughter or laughter. Yeah, that would that would make a lot of sense because, as I said, Sarah and Abraham laughed on various occasions at God. Uh, about that though, I could be inaccurate. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then. Um, Genesis 21 4 says, and Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God commanded him. Uh, uh, and Abraham was a hundred years old when I, his son Isaac was born unto him. Hundred years old. What a perk he was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just a, just a, yeah, I'm sorry. Trying to be a Theo comedian here. A hundred years old. I guess I guess peeps didn't age as quickly back then. Maybe it's you know it's hard to hard to imagine. I heard something about before Noah's flood that perhaps um, human metabolism was a little different, or or maybe uh, yeah, I heard something like that that people lived much older back then than than in this age. But I don't know. You know, it's just something I heard. I bet our, our brother Neff would have an opinion about that. I bet an articulate understanding about that. Yeah, yeah he, I'm sure he uh, has a lot more to say about it than we could. But it is true that in the genealogies that uh, uh, 
um, before the flood, it was common for people to live hundreds and hundreds of years old, uh, you know, six, seven, eight, nine hundred years old, and gradually our lifespan got less. I think at this time in history, though, that a uh, uh, hundred years old was a really old person at that time, and uh, and the idea of Abraham being a hundred and Sarah being, I think, 90, 90 years old uh, when she had. Uh, yes. And uh, was barren. Was I, barren at that yeah, age. Yes. Yeah. She definitely. She was way too old. She probably stopped, uh, you know, physiologically being able to give a child, uh, you know, maybe uh, fifty years earlier. Uh, and uh, and yet, and then once that happened. That's when the doubt comes in and say, "Hey, I, 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 just physiologically, I can't have children. It's it's clear because uh, it, I'm not my body parts are not working the way they used. I've gone through this change of life, and, uh, and that's why they say that they're barren because at a certain age, a woman becomes unable to. So the only way she's going to have a child would it have to be miraculous. All right, let's go to." Uh, uh, Genesis 21, 8. Uh, brother Bill, thank, thank you for your hospitality, my brother. Thank you so much. And thank you for, uh, well, I guess I'll thank my father for you. Uh, you're a walking ministry, no matter what you do. But, uh, but thank you. Thank you. It's my time. But thank you, sir. Okay. Is it time to go, brother? Yes, it is. God bless you. And right, thank thanks, you. thanks for joining me. Look forward to next time, brother. I'm the winner on this one. Thank you, sir. Bye now. Hi. Okay, so right now I'm on uh, Genesis 21, 8. I'm going to make a note to pick up there next time. Genesis 21, 8. Uh, all right, well, I want to thank uh, St. Tommy for joining me. It's uh, the only time you can have a conversation, and there has to be at least two people to have a conversation uh, with one person is just a lecture. So uh, I much prefer a conversation, and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, before I close the live broadcast, I want to not neglect the most important thing. Uh, studying all the scriptures is fascinating and beneficial, but there's one part of the scriptures are one part of theology, uh, the study of God, that, that, that is of utmost importance. The uh, fancy word for it is soteriology, the study of salvation. And as a, an evangelist, uh, that's my calling, uh, my ministry, and it's, I believe it's the most important thing that can ever be done. Uh, if, if I was able to give you food right now, or clothing, or money, you'd be blessed temporarily. Uh, but if I neglected what's most important, the other things are just temporary help. But if I can give you something that's eternal, something that lasts forever, and bless you in that way, then it's a far greater, more wonderful thing that, uh, that I've been able to do. And that is and so I'll do that now. I, I want to tell you the good news. And <laughs> it's, it's good news is not a good enough term. It's the greatest news. Uh, some people say this is the greatest story ever told. Um, you may have heard the term, the word gospel. It's just a Greek word. It means good news. And this, this news is that God has come to our rescue. God saw our situation. Man fell in the garden. Adam and Eve sinned. And we all have, uh, as descendants of Adam and Eve, have inherited genetically this sin nature, this sinfulness. And, and, and because of that, because we are all born as sinners, now, if a, you don't have to teach a baby how to lie. No one, you'd be shocked. Maybe at two or three years old, without being taught, children start lying. 
thing. Did you do that? No, I didn't do that. Well, what's that, you know, icing from the cake all over your face? Well, no, I didn't do that. That's what we do. We, we begin lying at a young age. We, be, we, we naturally do. It's our nature. It's who we are. And, and uh, because of the sinful nature and the sinful acts, the sinful thoughts that we have in our life, uh, God could not have a relationship with us. He created us for a relationship as his children. But because of sin, this relationship is, was severed and, and there's a barrier. You know, God is holy and perfect, and no sin. And then here we are. And God wants to join with us and have this relationship. There's sin between us. And that's a barrier that prevented us from the time of Adam and Eve until the time of Jesus Christ. This barrier was there. We could not have a relationship. But And, and man tried all kinds of things to try to solve the problem. Man invented all kinds of religions. And man thought that if I'm a religious enough, if I do enough good things and I abstain from doing all the bad things, that maybe God will be pleased with me and accept me back. But he couldn't because sin, sin still existed and the barrier, no matter what we tried, it failed. All religions failed. God, knowing that man was in a hopeless situation, could not remedy the problem himself. God took action. Uh, scripture says that God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So this good news, this the greatest story ever told. And by the way, this is a true story. It's not a story like making up an interesting story or a fable that just for entertainment's sake. This is a true story. It's an historical event. God saw our problem and said, I'll become a man. Why? Because he was going to come down and die for our sins. He was going to pay for our sins. He knew he had to become a man in order to die. So Jesus said he came down from heaven. He, the Bible says that God was manifest in the flesh. and God became a man. Jesus said the reason he did it was so that he could give his life as a ransom. A ransom is a payment made to set someone free. So Jesus, knowing this, willingly decided he would go and get on that cross, let them nail him to that cross. He could have prevented them. He's God. He could have struck them all dead, but he willingly let them nail him to the cross. He suffered and died as a payment for our sins. So this good news, this great news, is that Jesus paid for your sins. The barrier between you and God is gone. You have access to God. You can embrace Jesus Christ now if you want to. Jesus is reaching out. He wants to embrace you. He wants to hold you and never let you go. The Bible says that uh, I'll hold you in the palm of my hand and no one can pluck you out. I will never leave you or forsake you. But he doesn't impose himself on you. This must be a free will choice by you. Do you want to have a relationship with God? Do you want to embrace Jesus Christ as God and Savior? Do you believe that he did pay for your sins and that he will give you eternal life in heaven simply by trusting him, by believing in him? What the scriptures really ask us to do is, in Romans 10, 3, it, it says try and, they try to try establish their own righteousness instead of believing in the righteousness of God. I'm asking you to, Reject the idea that through your own righteousness, you can work your way up to heaven. Reject that. 
and instead believe in Jesus and righteousness, Jesus' work, his death on the cross for your sins, believe in that, believe in him, believe in his promise. His promise was, I will give you life everlasting if you believe in me. Believe in him for eternal life and he'll give it to you. Now, we don't have to accept this with blind faith. Jesus promised to give us a sign so that we could be confident in him. And the sign that he promised was a resurrection. He said that after three days of being dead, he would raise himself back to life. That would prove that he's God and he does have the power over life and death. And he did. He raised himself on the third day and he appeared to hundreds of people. And they touched him. They saw him. They spoke with him. They ate with him. And then he ascended up to heaven with God the Father. So he not only died for our sins, but he rose from the dead so that we can have confidence in putting our faith in him. Will you do it? I'm not asking you to join your religion. I'm not asking you to become a religious person. I'm not asking you to follow some set of religious rules. I'm asking you to trust a person. This person happens to be God who became a man named Jesus. Will you do it? Put your faith in him. I hope you do. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.